it's Patrick Hutzel from intensivecarehotline.com where we instantly improve the lives of families of critically ill patients in intensive care so that you can have peace of mind, real power, real control and so that you can influence decision making fast even if you're not a doctor or a nurse in intensive care. This is another episode of Your Questions Answered and in last week's episode I answered another question from one of our readers and the question last week was part two of my mother is in intensive care after her heart stopped. We believe that the intensive care team is keeping her sedated and paralyzed for longer than necessary. What should we do? You can check out the answer to last week's question by clicking on the link below this video. In this week's episode of Your Questions Answered, I want to answer the next question that Trudy from the UK has asked as her mother continued to be in intensive care after the cardiac arrest. So therefore, in today's episode of Your Questions Answered, I want to answer part three of My mother is in intensive care after her heart stopped. We believe that the intensive care team is keeping her sedated and paralyzed for longer than necessary. What should we do? Trudy writes, Hi Patrick, I've just come back from our meeting with the intensive care team. My mother's doing well. There could be a small issue with her heart, but those investigations will be developed in the cardiology ward. The meeting with the intensive care team went as well as could be expected. I prepared carefully, having researched the legal objections to our presence and had a strong case to refute these. They made no further objections on these grounds as they couldn't disagree. However, they said we got in the way and the only reason they had allowed us to stay at times was to avoid confrontation. That's poppycock. When the nurse we had faith in was with my mother, we told him if he needed space we would move. As we could see, he was trustworthy, but he assured us he wanted us there and he regularly made this assurance. There was no way he was just trying to avoid confrontation, although this may have been the cases with some of the other nurses. I hope we didn't get the good nurse in trouble. We'll be writing to the top bosses at the hospital to commend him and try and back this up with evidence of why this approach works. In any case, I don't really care why we are allowed to stay as long as we are. The doctor admitted he'd spend more time with us than other families, so clearly your strategies which we have adopted work. He said they couldn't bend the rules as they'd have to do it for everyone, but then said they had bent the rules for us. I understand they have a duty of care to all families and they need to balance that, but our duty of care is to our family and we'll maintain the pressure. I suggested the best way to reduce our questions and challenges was to work as hard as they could to make mum better and to demonstrate that by involving us fully. I also acknowledged that this family consensus style was unusual for them and probably made them feel uncomfortable, but it was our duty to make them question their practices. They said no ICU in the world could operate with open transparency. Have you got any examples which refute this I could share with them? Obviously they are busy and policies aren't going to be rethought in a week, but perhaps the experience they're having with us coupled with some evidence that other units are more open and transparent might make them rethink things in the long term. My explicit goal is to get my mom better as quickly as possible, but it's also starting to become being a champion for the powerless and trying to push for change. Thanks again and best wishes, Trudy. Hi Trudy, thanks again for sharing and also about shedding some light about how the doctors and or the intensive care team is seeing this situation. It's good to see that you have researched the legal objections to your presence with the intensive care team at the bedside. You see, this is something that I have found over and over again in more than 15 years intensive care nursing in three different countries where I have literally worked with thousands of critically ill patients and their families that 
whenever there is a perceived issue or perceived conflict with families that the intensive care team is going back and is referring to the legalities and or policies around family presence in intensive care. Sure enough, staff safety is just as important as patient and family safety and even though I have also seen my fair share of situations where staff have been verbally and physically threatened as well, including myself, by aggressive family members, this doesn't negate or exclude the fact that most families of critically ill patients in intensive care are peaceful and not threatening. Having said that, the intensive care team, doctors as well as nurses, are quick to point out in handovers that they are quote-unquote dealing with a difficult family. That in intensive care language means that they are asking too many difficult questions and they are generally speaking quote-unquote a pain in the ass. That's how the intensive care team perceives those situations and it still amazes me how anyone can think that way. Now from my perspective no family in RCU is difficult unless they are verbally or physically threatening. Everything else is just a matter of communication and also about showing empathy and compassion towards their situation. Does that include work and effort? Yes, it does. And I think that's where it's often falling down. As I have written extensively in my Instant Impact report, intensive care teams are like fish in water and families and patients are like fish out of water. The intensive care team is within their comfort zone most of the time and they don't like to leave that comfort zone. It's very easy for them to just refer to policies, procedures and basically implicitly or explicitly refer to the rules made by the ICU team and refer to their perceived power and to their perceived authority status. Families of critically ill patients in intensive care are not meant to question this approach. If they do, they upset the status quo and frequently they run into trouble with the perceived authority and the perceived power. And most of the time, families back off because, because just like you have alluded to in one of your emails, you were worried that the intensive care team might get prejudiced against you. Yes, and they often will get prejudiced. But just as I mentioned to you previously, it's none of your business what other people think about you, as long as you are ethical and on moral high grounds. The approach of getting families of critically ill patients involved works, because families all of a sudden have peace of mind, control, power and influence. It's nothing the intensive care team is interested in and as I regularly publish on my blogs, there are too many things happening behind the scenes in intensive care that the intensive care team has no interest whatsoever in sharing any power or control with families of critically ill patients. The power play, the dynamics, the politics, the competing interests, the intrigue, the psychology and the hidden agenda in intensive care is all driven by the all-powerful intensive care team. There is no room for genuine family input. One way to protect the intensive care team's interest is to, once again, implicitly or explicitly refer to the perceived power or perceived authority of the intensive care team. A frame of mind that is working most of the time as families, even in this day and age, in the 21st century, tend to buy into this outdated behavior and perception. They are afraid of repercussions for their sick family member if they don't buy into this outdated behavior. Therefore, the approach the intensive care team is taking is working for them most of the time. This is even more concerning because many of them, many of the most challenging situations in intensive care involve issues such as critically ill patients being very unstable and in a very critical condition or they are in a life-threatening situation. They could be in intensive care for long-term treatments and long-term stays. They might as well be having a severe or traumatic head or brain injury. They are often threatened with an NFR, not for resuscitation or DNR, do not resuscitate order. Or they are in a situation where the intensive care team suggests 
a withdrawal of treatment or a limitation of treatment as being quote unquote in the best interest of your critically ill loved one or they might even be approaching their end of life in intensive care and yet those are exactly the situations where the intensive care team is extremely guarded and is not willing to be transparent for reasons I mentioned before. You also mentioned that the intensive care team has referred to that they only allowed you to stay to avoid confrontation. I call BS for all of that as they one way or another felt that you were different and that they realized that they were dealing with a powerful family. Good on you for standing your ground and not backing off. I think it's rude of the intensive care team to say to you that you've got in the way. That is condescending from my perspective. Why did you get in the way? To stop them from doing what? Did you stop them from carrying out their duty of care? Hardly so, therefore ignore. You have also referred to the intensive care team saying that they couldn't bend the rules as they'd have to do it for everyone but then said they had bent the rules for us. Again this is BS from my perspective and they operate from a frame of mind that this is how it's always been and we don't want to change. Change however is exactly what is needed and intensive care teams are scared of change for reasons I have mentioned before. And if they felt that they have bent the rules for you Keep in mind it was their rules, not yours. Therefore, rewriting the rules and not bending down to perceived authority and perceived power is critical in those situations. By now, you know what's possible. You make up your own rules. Again, the fish in water, the intensive care team, is too complacent to deal with basic instinct needs such as peace of mind, control, power and influence from a family's perspective. It's the latent and persistent we know what's best approach by the intensive care team that doesn't look at how they can genuinely cooperate with families of critically ill patients. Again Trudy, you have referred to your duty to make the intensive care team question their practice and they are telling you that no ICU in the world could operate with open transparency. And that's probably true. And that's also why our platform, intensivecarehotline.com, is so popular and in demand. Because we make the information that the intensive care team is trying to hide away from you and trying to hide away from other family members in intensive care transparent. That's also why I can't give you any examples of intensive care units who are fully open and transparent. The financial interests, the bad management pressures, the staffing issues and interests, the medical research interests and the natural and or artificial hierarchy in intensive care often takes prevalence before patients and families interests. Again, if you look at documents, white papers and research studies done about intensive care, the focus is on medical research. It's all about how great they are. It's all written in a language that's from health professionals for health professionals research papers, documents and white papers are not even remotely designed for families of critically ill patients. That's also why there is little to no evidence as yet that a different approach where families have more and direct involvement in the care and treatment of their loved one would actually work. I just wanted to share more light on this and explain things in more detail and the bottom line to me is that you will probably be one of the few families of critically ill patients in intensive care who will do whatever it takes to have peace of mind, control, power and influence. Other families will continue to suffer, to back off at the first sign of resistance from the intensive care team. They will continue to feel intimidated by the intensive care team and they will continue to be passive bystanders and witness an event but not fully participate in it without understanding what's really happening and they will wind up with no peace of mind, no control, no power and no influence. Our platform intensivecarehotline.com continues to be a strong voice and advocate for the families of the critically ill in intensive care. But as the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to the water but you can't make them drink. 
it'll be up to families just like yours to take charge and to assume peace of mind, control, power and influence. How can you have more peace of mind, more control, more power and more influence whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care? You get to that all-important feeling of peace of mind, control, power and influence when you download your free Instant Impact Report now by entering your email below. In your free Instant Impact Report you learn quickly how to get peace of mind, real power and real control and how you can influence decision making fast whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care. Your free Instant Impact Report gives you in-depth insight that you must know whilst your loved one is critically ill or is even dying in intensive care. Sign up and download your free Instant Impact Report now by entering your email below. In your free Instant Impact Report you learn how to speak the secret intensive care language so that the doctors and the nurses know straight away that you are an insider and that you know and understand what's really happening in intensive care. In your free report you will also discover how to ask the doctors and the nurses the right questions. Discover the many competing interests in intensive care and how your critically ill loved one's treatment may depend on those competing interests. How to eliminate fear, frustration, stress, struggle and vulnerability even if your loved one is dying. You get five killer tips and strategies helping you to get on the right path to peace of mind, control, power and influence in your situation. You will get real world examples that you can easily adapt to your and your critically ill loved one's situation. How to stop being intimidated by the intensive care team and how you will be seen as equals. You will get crucial behind the scenes insight so that you know and understand what's really happening in intensive care and how you need to manage doctors and nurses in intensive care and it's not what you think. Thank you for tuning into this week's Your Questions Answered and I'll see you again in another update next week. Make sure you also check out our blog section for more tips and strategies or send me an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com with your questions. This is Patrick Hutzel from intensivecarehotline.com and I'll see you again next week in another update.